Tēnā koutou koutoua, ko Phil Bremer, tāko inua, no mai, hāri mai. As Acting Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to celebrate Professor Eger's achievements. I'd like to especially welcome Dr Eger's family and friends who are here this evening. In particular, I would like to welcome her mother, Joy, partner, Alan, daughter, Kate, wider family members, Rachel, Adam, Ben and Sophie, close friend, Catherine, and close former colleague, Kay. I am delighted that you're able to share this very spe special occasion with us this evening. It's not easy to become a professor at the University of Otago. The title of professor is reserved for the highest achieving academics. It takes ability, commitment, and hard work to become a professor. You need to be able to demonstrate that you are a leader in your field of research, an outstanding teacher, and that you are providing significant service to the academic and wider community. As you're here tonight, Professor Edgar has clearly earned the title of Professor. Professor Edgar's research has informed understanding of the role human resource management plays in delivering a variety of performance outcomes and the importance of employees as organisational stakeholders. This research has also directly benefited her students by helping them to become better prepared for the workplace. In addition to teaching and research, Dr Eger also undertakes a wide range of service roles for the benefit of the department, the university, and the wider academic and general community. I now invite the Pro Vice Chancellor of Commerce, Professor Marie Tyne, to introduce Professor Eger. Professor Bremner, tēnā koe. Professor Edgar, tēnā koe. Professor Walton, tēnā koe. Alan, Joy, Kate and Kay, and extended whānau and friends, tēnā koutou. Friends, colleagues, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, ko Marie Tain tokawingua. I have the privilege of being the Pro Vice-Chancellor of the Division of Commerce, the division in which the department that Fiona leads, the management department, is housed. And it is my absolute pleasure to warmly welcome you all here today to Professor Edgar's inaugural prof professorial lecture, if only I could say it. <clears throat> Fiona Edgar was promoted to professor in February of this year and tonight we come together to celebrate this auspicious achievement. Professor Edgar grew up right here in Dunedin, attending Kaikarai Valley High School and later the University of Otago, where she completed a BCom Honours majoring in management and then a PhD entitled Regulating for Best Practice in Human Resource Management. The Impact of the Good Employer Obligation. This research reviewed the Good Employer Directive under the State Sector Act 1988 on HRM, Human Resource Management, outlining implications for practitioners, critiquing the importance placed on HRM and the quality of the HRM practice and assessing their contribution to employee wellbeing. This has continued to be the research thread throughout Professor Edgar's academic career. After graduating with her PhD, Professor Edgar began as a teaching assistant and a bright future doctoral fellow in the Department of Management before becoming a lecturer in 2003. She was then promoted up through the ranks to senior lecturer and then associate professor and now full professor. In 2016, Professor Edgar became the associate dean postgraduate for the Commerce Division she stayed in this role until 2019, when she became head of the Department of Management, a role that she continues in today. As already stated, a promotion to full pro professor at the University of Otago is not a step taken lightly. You must excel in all three areas of the role, teaching, research and service. Professor Edgar has certainly achieved this over her career as an academic. 
As a leader in research on human resource management, Professor Edgar seeks to understand how the workforce is best managed while at the same time promoting worker and workplace well-being. Professor Edgar's research was some of the first to acknowledge employees as important HRM stakeholders and her highly cited and award-winning research has informed various stakeholders, including employers, practitioners, and students. Professor Edgar publishes in the top journals in her field and serves on editorial boards as well as co-chairing conferences. She has developed and maintained a wide international collaborative network in which she has developed her HRM research into cross-cultural contexts. Professor Edgar not only excels at research, but is an experienced and outstanding teacher. Teaching across all levels, Professor Edgar's teaching is extremely well received by students. She is an excellent communicator and innovator of teaching material, having received excellent feedback and teaching accolades across and throughout her teaching career. Professor Edgar continues to lead course design and development and has been instrumental in developing new programs for the Division of Commerce, including the development of the HRM Diploma for Graduates and the Distance Master of Sustainable Business program. Professor Edgar has a, an impressive supervision profile and I know is a passionate supervisor of many PhD and DBA students, as well as MCOM, MBIS and MBA students. Professor Edgar's service commitments have been wide and reaching across the management department, the Division of Commerce and the University. She has been the head of the Department of Management since July 2019, at which time she led a large department specifically around prioritising cultural competencies and developing and implementing an equitable workload model. I can certainly attest to Professor Edgar's very collegial manner in working with other heads of departments and fellow colleagues and sharing ideas and initiatives within the division. Prior to taking on the head of department role, Professor Edgar was the Associate Dean Postgraduate for the Division of Commerce for three years, in which time she developed and led induction programs for students develop strategic imperatives for postgrad students in commerce, and represented the division on a large number of university and divisional committees. Professor Edgar has undertaken various additional service roles over the years across the division and within her department, including acting deputy HOD, divisional research committee representative, and postgraduate coordinator in the Department of Management. She is not only an excellent and very active citizen across the university, but Professor Edgar also contributes to the wider community, especially through her board memberships with HRNZ and the Association of Industrial Relations Academics Australia and New Zealand. And all of that is just a snippet into the career of Professor Edgar so far. And I'm sure we'll learn more about this this evening from the professor herself. And now, what I would like to personally share about Professor Fiona Edgar. I have been fortunate to work alongside Fiona for a number of years. And I would just like to say that not only does Fiona excel in all aspects of academia, but she is also exceptional in her commitment to her department, the wider Division of Commerce, and the University of Otago. Fiona consistently wants the best for our students and faculty members. She actively contributes to and leads decisions around the strategic direction of our division going forward and also the day-to-day -day running of the division as a whole. What I find is that we, when Fiona speaks, I listen. Her suggestions are thoughtful, thought-provoking and forward-focused. Fiona is a colleague who comes bearing answers and solutions, for which I am always grateful. And I thoroughly enjoy being in your company. We share a passion for developing and managing a world-class business school, a love of a good chat over a coffee, and a shared appreciation of a you-me handbag. 
I feel extremely fortunate to work alongside Professor Fiona Edgar, and I am delighted and privileged to be able to warmly welcome her up here now to give her inaugural professorial lecture. Please welcome Professor Fiona Edgar. Nā mihi nui. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Fiona Edgar Takawingawa, roto i Tomataranga Whakahaere. I warmly welcome you here today to my inaugural professorial lecture. Thank you, Marie, for that uh, very, very uh, warm introduction, kind introduction. And I would like to thank you all for joining me here on this uh, very special occasion. So I would like uh, to dedicate my IPL to a special group of family and friends and colleagues who are no longer with us. All were very supportive of my study and my career and they would be very proud to see me standing here today. So the first is my father who um, sadly passed away just before my PhD uh, was completed, so conferred, so he passed away during um, the examination process. The second person there is my favourite uncle. We all have a favourite uncle and Bill was my favourite uncle. I was the first in our family to uh, successfully complete my study at the university and my uncle was particularly loud and proud about that. I also have a dear friend, Bernie Haynes, who passed away earlier this year from cancer. Again, very, very uh, supportive of my career. And last and importantly, this is Mary Mallon, and Mary was my uh, PhD supervisor. Mary came to Otago from the UK where she had had previously a career as a practitioner. She was an absolutely amazing person. She was very energetic, very charismatic, and she was very quickly promoted through uh, to prof professor ending up at Massey University in Palmerston North. Mary was heaps of fun. She had a love of socialising. She, like Marie and others, also had a love of fashion and she is a, a, was a great loss to our academic community. So I know she would be very proud to see me here today. So just in terms of the format of my lecture, the first, um, I'm going to talk to you about some of my formative workplace experiences because these have really underpinned what I went on to research as an academic. I'll then present an overview of the different research themes which I've pursued during my academic career. And then I want to um, conclude by acknowledging uh, family, friends, and also colleagues who have supported me throughout my academic career. All right, so in terms of background, <clears throat> I was a very late starter to academia, and it would be fair to say that I am very much uh, an accidental professor. So initially it was my close friend Catherine who inspired me to take up university study. She had that knack of making studying while raising a family, a very young family, and uh, working as well look very easy. Of course, that was uh, very deceiving. It wasn't an easy feat at all, and um, I'm pleased I survived it. When I look back and reflect on those years now, I couldn't have achieved what I did without my mum in the support of my daughters, but more on that later. So while it was Catherine that encouraged me to study, it was my early work experiences in industry that really ignited my passion for studying people management. And it was also these experiences that went on to shape my views about employment relationships between um, managers and workers in the workplace. So I just want to give you some context as to what those work experiences entailed. So I went into the workforce in the early 1980s and one of my roles was working in an administrative function in a large home appliance manufacturer that made ovens and dishwashers. I then moved on in the mid 1980s to work for a large clothing retailer, which is still um, doing very well today, in the head office, and that um, organisation also had a warehouse function as part of it. And then in the late 1980s and the start of, through to the start of the early 1990s, I worked for a large manufacturing organisation that made uh, taps and showers. 
This was, however, a very interesting time for managers and for workers. This was a period in which the New Zealand economy had become deregulated, tariff protections had been removed, and organisations were really struggling to remain competitive. And so they had to think very carefully about what it was they were going to do so that they could survive and um, grow if they were lucky. So as you can imagine, this was a very tumultuous period for businesses and it was a period which was characterised by a lot of um, uncertainty and change, both for managers but for workers as well. And so in that first organisation that closed, the second one relocated up to Auckland and the third one had a series of redundancies and then eventually closed as well. So as you can imagine, those experiences made for some very interesting work stories. So in some cases, I watched these events from the sidelines. In other cases, I was privy to the inner circles of decision making, although not part of the decision making. And in others, I was personally involved. So just um, to give you some ideas of the things that happened during one retrenchment situation, I can recall the union boss um, charging through a set of um, swinging doors into a factory setup and ordering the workforce out onto the street. So he called them all out and had them all um, congregate on the street. And he did that, or the union was doing that, to let the uh, management of that organisation know that they were not going to sit by and idly watch as workers were losing their jobs. In that same organisation, there were also incidents of sabotage with the machinery um, getting filled up with um, superglue and whatnot, so that um, there, there were some quite serious um, things going on. Uh, likewise, in the retailing organisation that I worked with, again, in a, in a um, voice to let management know that they weren't going to sit idly by with job losses on the um, near future or on the horizon, there was quite a lot of theft and there was a gym located next door and people from the gym would say, you know, is it, is it normal for all that stuff to be getting fired out the back windows of that organisation? And of course it wasn't, but, you know, I mean, to management's um, credit, they turned a blind eye to it anyway. On a more positive note, I had the privilege of sitting around the table in one of the organisations as a representative of the workforce negotiating team while we negotiated the redundancy for uh, the organisation that was relocating to Auckland. And so that provided me with some very interesting insights into managers' thoughts, I guess, and the thoughts on employees and also just in terms of the employment relationship. Less positive, however, was or were my experiences when I returned to work after having children. So as a working mother, I returned to work um, out of financial necessity, and this was at a time when not all embraced the notion of working mothers. So I found that quite a challenging, quite a confronting time, and I'm pleased to say that as I watch my daughters and their partners manage the um, parenting roles and work and balance that work and family life, that things have very much changed and very much changed for the better. So it is very heartening to see that we have come a very long way in that regard. So when Shannon, my youngest daughter, was aged one, I commenced full-time study at university. And one of the subjects that I studied was management, and there was a lot about that subject which really resonated well with my past work experiences. And I particularly enjoyed learning about employment relations and human resource management. And just because those two areas are um, integral to the rest of my presentation, I'll just explain briefly the broad um, underpinnings and what they refer to. So employment relations is a, a pluralist discipline, so it acknowledges that there are different parties in the employment relationship, and sometimes those parties have similar objectives, and it, sometimes those objectives um, can come into conflict with each other. So for example, you may find in terms of managers and workers that all, both of them, both parties want good levels of productivity and both obviously want the organisation to survive and be successful. But in other cases you might find that employees want high wages, they want good working conditions and this may at some stages conflict with managers or employers of organisations who may be looking to maximise or optimise 
their returns for shareholders. So this can lead to inevitable conflict. And so given the workplace experiences that I had um, through that period of the 80s and early 90s, it was very much a perspective, I guess, that resonated with me. I, I saw that pluralism at play in the workplace. And the other discipline that I really enjoyed studying was human resource management. And that's essentially concerned with how managers manage their workforce so that their organisation can be successful and achieve its objectives. And so while I did not um, share the unitary underpinnings of human resource management, what I did accept was the notion that um, you can have functional areas, selection, training and development, performance management, rewards and the like, and that if you implement those um, practices in those areas effectively, then it will have some benefit to your organisation in terms of helping it be successful. So as I completed my undergraduate study and I moved into postgraduate study, I became increasingly interested in trying to meld aspects of employment relations and human resource management into a view which saw both, both managers and workers getting something out of the employment relationship so that both could flourish in the employment relationship. And so it was at the suggestion of Ian McAndrew, my PhD supervisor, that I chose to investigate whether we could regulate for best practice in human resource management. And to this end, I examined, as um, Marie kindly said, Section 56 of the State Sector Act, which was an obligation to be a good employer. And just a note there that that Act has now been replaced with the Public Service Act 2020, and Section 73 very much mirrors um, Section 56, so, so not a lot has changed there. All right, so just so that you know what an obligation to be a good employer looks like, it is one where uh, chief executives working in the public sector are required to have HRM policies and practices that ensure that there is impartiality in selection, that the working environment is a good and safe one for employees, that there is an equal employment opportunities program in place, and that the HRM policies and practices ensure that the aims, aspirations and employment requirements of Māori ethnic minority groups, women and people with disabilities are recognised. So KPIs are essentially put in place with the performance of chief executives measured against um, those KPIs which address those requirements. All right, so my PhD um, did effectively find that Section 56 was effective and it was um, significant in, uh, in terms of policy development in those legislated areas and also particularly in the area of EEO, the outcomes were particularly um, good for the public service. So yes, I found that you could indeed regulate for best practice in human resource management. However, whilst my thesis was concerned with examining the notion that we could regulate for HRM efficacy, the main contribution of my study was that I had introduced employees' voice into the data collection process. So previously, in terms of um, looking at HRM efficacy or the effectiveness of HRM policies and practices, uh, we would go out as researchers and we would use a single or singular data source. So we would ask HR managers to comment on their HRM policies and to comment on their efficacy. And so I found that problematic, so along with others as well. It was a problematic because we're effectively asking HR managers to comment on their own performance. They put the HR practices in place and we're asking them if they're effective. Of course they're going to say they are. So we found that problematic. So our approach, or my approach, um, was the view that if you want to find out if HRM is effective or not, you also need to ask employees about HRM efficacy. So you need to ask employees about the practices. Because if a, an employee finds a particular practice related to rewards or training development, recruitment selection, if they find it or if they have a negative experience with it, then it's likely that that practice is not going to be um, effective in delivering what it's supposed to deliver for the organisation. 
So, um, yeah, so I guess the, the main contribution of that study was that it introduced the employee's voice into HRM data collection and assessing HRM efficacy. So maintaining this emphasis on understanding how employees can best, best flourish at work, my next research thread focused around employees' well-being. So in terms of employees' well, well-being, employee well-being, um, the emphasis was very much on well-being as um, an end in itself. So we measured well-being looking at job satisfaction, commitment, engagement, and we looked at it as an end in itself. So, you know, can, can we facilitate employees' well-being? Whereas this research was concerned with looking at the extent to which employee well-being was not only an end in itself, but it was also a contributor to the organisation and its um, productivity, performance, profit and growth. And so this was a view that our researchers have referred to as mutual gains. So there are mutual gains, gains for the organisation and gains for the employee. And also just another note there, um, when looking at wellbeing, I'd reviewed a number of government reports that were written at the time and I generally found that in those government reports, whilst they made uh, you know, a lot of mentions in terms of well-being, it was primarily about the physical well-being of employees. And I wanted to broaden that conception or notion of well-being so that it also included our social and our psychological well-being as well. So this research found that HRM did play a key role in promoting wellbeing outcomes and that these in turn impacted our task performance, which is our job-related performance, and also our contextual performance, which are those helping behaviours that we can engage in in the workplace to help our um, colleagues out with things. So our finding um, of that connection, whilst that was um, important, of more significance and interest really was our finding that different wellbeing outcomes supported different performance, out performance outcomes. And specifically what we found was that um, HRM systems could be designed to support trust and happiness and that where you uh, look to support trust and happiness or where HRM practices were designed to support trust and happiness then uh, they, those were good or great um, contributors to performance. So along with um, looking after the job satisfaction, commitment and engagement of employees, we encouraged pra uh, practitioners to also address the trust and happiness aspects of wellbeing as well. All right, so as you can see by the heading on the slide, some of my research could appear to be going down a rabbit hole or a side alley, and I confess that some of my projects did start um, along these lines because I personally found the subject matter either topical, interesting or most likely both. But always as I investigated a topic, it always linked back to that HRM wellbeing performance relationship that I had built my research career on. And this was no different for the study on alcohol. So alcohol consumption, as you will appreciate, is an issue that is often covered by the media. And at the time of conducting this study, there was significant media attention that was focused on looking at the societal and community issues that were manifesting from our country's drinking behaviours. So as researchers, we noted that whilst there was a lot of attention focused on the community and on society, very little was being said about what the effects that this might be having in the workplace itself. And so teaming up with my colleague Emma McAndrew and health economist Trudy Sullivan, who is not only a very respected colleague of mine, but also a long time friend and also my former flatmate, we developed a project that looked at the impact of alcohol in the workplace. And there were three areas that we focused on. So we were looking at behaviours, we were looking at productivity and performance outcomes. So socially, uh, alcohol in the workplace can be seen as a bit of a positive thing, as a social lubricant, it can help with collegiality, it can help with team building. So with this in mind, we thought we would collect insights and work stories from a sample of nearly 200 New Zealand employees about social events that they had attended in recent years. 
and these work stories painted a picture which suggested that the work social event was becoming um, increasingly problematic. So we found alcohol at social events was being connected to a high rate of concerning behaviours, including such things as giving people a shove, a lot of aggression, incivility, rudeness and bullying, sexual harassment, and also at the more extreme ends of the scale, there was physical and verbal assaults as well. So as a consequence of those findings, we sought to offer what we referred to as some sage advice for employees and employers. So in terms of employees, we suggested to them in the media that they should know their own limits and that they should stay well within those limits. For employers, we recommended that they understand their obligations to employees on work social occasions. They develop good policies to address those social occasions. And also really importantly, that they establish good drinking, um, good drinking norms for their employees so that these behaviours don't get out of hand. And then, of course, um, we reminded everyone attending work social events that those events are really just an extension of the workplace itself. And so the same standard of behaviour is expected within or at those occasions as we might expect within the workplace itself. All right, so I'm sure it comes as no surprise to anyone here that alcohol creates problems and those problems result in significant costs to the economy. However, the amount of that cost may surprise you and this was what we investigated in the next study. So the second um, project that came out of the study was led by Trudy Sullivan and it aimed to quantify the costs of alcohol-related issues in terms of productivity. And as as a result of some very um, complex statistical analyses that Trudy generated, we estimated that the cost of employees drinking was leading to productivity losses of around $1.65 billion to um, New Zealand organisations per year. Interestingly, some of that cost in that $1.65 billion related to co-workers. So it was the problems that the stress and the disruption that our co-workers experienced from someone else's drinking behaviours. So it's not just the individual and their loss of productivity, it was the effect and the impact that they were having on others. That was quite a significant um, contributor to that figure that we have there. So our hope was that um, organisations might take note of the significant cost that alcohol can have on organisations and on individuals. And also because we spend such a lot of our time at the workplace, we hoped that uh, employers might make this a forum where they could engage in education about alcohol related education for their employees with the hope that that would have some community and societal benefit as well as of course benefiting the organisation as well. And there is some research which suggests that the workplace is a beneficial forum for making that sort of, or undertaking that sort of education. So on a positive note, uh, recently in the media there have been a few commentaries around alcohol consumption and it would appear that the drinking behaviours of the generations coming behind us may not um, suffer from some of the same issues that um, the generations that uh, have followed them. All right, and then just one final comment I would like to make about that study. It received um, a significant amount of media attention, so we fronted the um, National Radio News and also the TV News, and I would like to acknowledge the um, great work that Ian and Trudy both did in fronting the media for that um, project, or for those projects. All right, so as you can see from the study on alcohol, emotions are important. So my next research agenda turned to look more closely at how employees' emotions impact our behaviour at work. And to this end, I engaged with the positive psychology literature. So interestingly, there has been a lot of work in the organisational behaviour area, and it is focused primarily on negative um, behaviours such as unhappy workers, stressed workers, and the cost that those um, behaviours have for organisations. 
And indeed, there was a review conducted by Luthens of the contemporary psychology literature where he found that there were approximately 200,000 articles published on the treatment of mental illness, 80,000 on depression, 65,000 looked at anxiety, 20,000 on fear, 10,000 on anger, but there were only around 1,000 studies that had looked at positive concepts and capabilities of people. So not surprisingly, we agreed um, with, that, um, with the encouragement that Luthens and others suggested and that we adopt a more positive agenda. So we thought that was a good idea, especially given the findings from our previous studies. And so we looked at how the work environment might impact our emotional psyche. So our emotional states, as you'll be aware, are quite malleable. That means that they can be changed or altered or manipulated. So given the premise, or our premise was that HRM might be able to manipulate or change our emotional states at work. It's also an important um, thing to note that our emotions have, have a contagion effect, and that means if you're positive at work, it can have a flow on positive effect to your colleagues at work. Likewise, if you're negative at work, that can also have a contagion effect and um, have a negative impact on your colleagues. So the purpose of this study was to see if HRM was a mechanism that employers could use to promote positive emotions amongst our workforce. And we found that, yes, it was. We specifically found that where HRM supports positive emotions, then employees are likely to reciprocate by engaging in those helping behaviours that I talked about earlier, those citizenship behaviours, which are very beneficial for organisational performance. All right, so just um, on a slightly lighter note, I also had a look and conducted a study on the emotion of schadenfreude. So this looked at um, schadenfreude in the workplace, and they always say you should study things that are of interest to you, and schadenfreude is an um, emotion which just fascinates me, no end. And why wouldn't it? If you just have a look at this quote. Unlike most things that light up your ventral striatum, schadenfreude is free, it's not fattening, and you don't have to take your clothes off. It can't hurt and it might just make you feel a little better. So what is schadenfreude? It is that furtive glee we feel when we observe another's misfortune. Now it is a pleasurable state, all right? It's a positive state. Please do not confuse it with envy, which is when we observe another's good fortune, and envy is a negative state and that can cause us pain. So it's a, it's a positive state. Another caveat that I need to add in here is that um, schadenfreude is not harmful and it only really relates to minor misfortunes. So if we were thinking about work, we're talking about a colleague making a fool of themselves in a meeting. We are not talking about a colleague being made redundant or something more serious, all right? So it is um, minor misfortunes. So I feel this emotion. I'm not proud that I feel it, but it is something that I can relate to. So when I started researching this emotion, I suspect that some of my colleagues thought that when I said I experienced it, they thought I was experiencing it within the work context. I want to make it clear that I wasn't. We do work in competitive environments, and it wasn't because of this that my interest in this emotion was stimulated. So that said, it is not beyond the realm of possibility that we could find ourselves working with a colleague who suggests that while your research is suitable for publication in those mid-tier journals, theirs is destined for much higher honours. And it could be that when you hear that their most recent submission to that top tier journal was desk rejected, you might feel a wee pang of furtive glee. And if you did, then that would be schadenfreude. <laughs> However, that is, not where, um, that is not where I felt the emotion. No, not for me. My schadenfreude came from my love of sport and probably the love of my son-in-law. So, he's a professional rugby player, and when he was competing for a spot in the team, 
I would secretly enjoy that moment when a contemporary vying for the same position as him would drop the ball, or they'd miss a tackle. I would feel that we sense furtively, so I would feel schadenfreude. So let's just be clear, it wasn't, it wasn't the workplace. All right, so back to something more serious. With this study, I was interested in understanding what, pa uh, what impact the schadenfreude emotion might have on our behaviour at work. So competitive um, workplace environments are fairly commonplace today, and that's an environment where winning is valued over everything else. And often we will see um, colleagues pitted against each other for resources or for managerial attention or for um, status or wages, <coughs> promotions and the like. So in these types of environments, we would design our HR practices specifically so that we could elicit competition amongst our employees or groups of employees. And so the question I asked was, do competitive work environments encourage the experience of this emotion? And my concern was that in these types of environments, if we do encourage this type of emotion, then it might inhibit employees from engaging in those collegiality or those citizenship behaviours that I've talked about earlier. And so that was the focus of this study. And the results showed that, yes indeed, employees um, are cognitive that they're working in a competitive environment, or they're also cognitive, um, the study found, if they're working in a collaborative environment. They're aware of what particular HRM practices are in place that set them up or put them against each other. Um, but it, what it didn't find was that um, Whilst it did foster the emotion of schadenfreude amongst these individuals, that it's competitive environments, that emotion, when it was invoked, it did not um, inhibit people or um, deter them from engaging in organisational citizenship behaviours. So they still behaved um, positively towards their colleagues. So this suggests that while the emotion of schadenfreude is felt in competitive environments, neither its invocation or its prevalence appeared to impact those collegial behaviours. So I guess um, after that I wondered, well, what, what might be at play here? And just something that came from the study was, usually when we talk about schadenfreude and we, we were looking at um, behavioural manifestations of it in the workplace, the research suggests that it will uh, result in people calling out others' errors in front of other people, so making a fool of them in front of other people, or unchecked gossiping around the water cooler, or withholding that inf uh, support or information that I talked about with collegiality. However, in the New Zealand context, what was interesting was that the sample of employees for this study found that those behaviours were both unsporting and both inappropriate in New Zealand workplaces. So that um, was quite interesting. And I thought it might be linked to, um, <clears throat> or it might be worth, I guess, looking at this in relation to uh, the prevalence of the tall poppy syndrome, which is so often talked about in the New Zealand context. Of course, that, that is research for another day. All right, so just the last um, section of research that I'd like to talk to you about is uh, research which looks at sustainable HRM. So um, this research is led by my colleague Natasha, um, very, very talented academic colleague. And it is with much um, pleasure that I've been able to observe in recent years and as a result of Natasha's interest in this area, that pluralism, which I talked about right back at the outset, being related to um, employment relations, is gaining an, uh, it's having a resurgence, and it's very much now being accepted because sustainable HRM and sustainability recognises that we have different stakeholders in the workplace and that these groups need to work together for a common good. So it very much has a, a pluralist lens. So sustainable HRM reflects an emphasis on environmental, economic and social goals. And so what that means effectively in terms of work is that employee wellbeing is, is now a, it's a, it's a goal, it's an objective that employers necessarily have to promote within their organisations alongside of their other objectives. So one of the problems that uh, our research, my research with Natasha has identified 
is that uh, there is a gap between what we're finding in the research and our ability to disseminate those findings to the practitioner community. So that is um, one of our goals. It's a work on, as I've got in my notes here, for us to find ways to more effectively translate and disseminate those research findings so that organisations can benefit from them. All right, and then just um, another issue that we've, um, or question that we're asking in relation to sustainable HRM is who should be responsible for driving the organisation's sustainability of gender? And of course, um, we think it's HR. We think the HR function is positioned really well to drive that agenda. However, um, when you talk to HR practitioners, um, they're not so clear that either they're positioned well or what it might mean for them in terms of driving that agenda. So our study has so far found that practitioners um, are unclear, I guess, about what is sustainable HRM, what it means to them, and how they might drive that in their organisations. So there's a lot of work that's been done around that. And then I'd just um, like to mention here as well that um, this foray into sustainable HRM, again, as I've just mentioned, is um, motivated by Natasha, has opened the door for several um, really interesting international collaborations. So I've worked with colleagues Linnea, Joe, and Natasha for writing a book chapter that looks at sustainable HRM um, in Australia and New Zealand. And also Natasha and I are working with an international research team based out of Poland um, in this area as well. All right, so just um, wrapping up. In terms of teaching, I like to teach through a pluralist lens. So I've always brought that pluralist lens to my teaching. So I've always tried to get students to understand that need to ensure that um, as much as the organisation's objectives need to be met, the employees also have objectives and we need to think about how we can support those objectives in the workplace. So if I was to be um, asked what would success like, be like for me, I would say success would be if our graduates from the Department of Management emerged as being socially responsible HR practitioners. So that um, would be something, that is something that I aspire to. All right, acknowledgements. All right, there are a few. Ian, Ian and Alan. So Ian was my PhD supervisor. Both Ian and Alan were mentors. mentors. I learnt from the very best. I was privileged to work with both Ian and Alan, who combined um, provided our department with what I can um, confidently state it was probably the leading employment relations programs in New Zealand. Public service, well actually private and public service organisations were after our students. They headhunted our students because those guys did such a great job. They also had very dry sense of uh, a very dry sense of humour, um, which could sometimes be a bit hard to take. All right, um, I would also like to thank Marie, Robin, and Sarah. So um, they all hold dean roles or have held dean roles within the Otago Business School. I'd like to thank um, Robin for having faith in our department. When I took over as head of department, we didn't have any professors, and I said to Robin that as a department we had agreed that an effective strategy going forward would be to grow our own. We um, hadn't had a lot, a lot of luck in terms of recruiting and retaining people, so we thought growing our own might be the best. Well, I'm proud to be standing here as evidence that that strategy has been successful. Sarah Walsh and my colleague um, also evidence of that, so thank you. I couldn't have um, a better PVC. Marie, you're awesome, so thank you very much. Research colleagues, um, Alan, Ian, just Nat um, Annie, Natasha, Adil, Trudy, Elaine, Yulia, Connor, Paula, and there, there are a lot more I could mention as well, but I just want to acknowledge, um, acknowledge you there. Kay and Nancy, um, a good department is um, hinged to its academic support and Kay and Nancy were two of the very best. So their support is crucial for making our lives easier and for making us effective in terms of delivering our research and our teaching. 
So I was very lucky to work with Kay and Nancy and the team that we have now. Um, our academic support staff do a, a fabulous job. Kay and Nancy, um, I'm very lucky to still have them as long-term friends as well. And that's really what work should be all about. It's, it's a place where you should have fun and you should make friendships. And to all my colleagues from the Department of Management, uh, past and future, thank you very much. Your collegiality um, is very, very um, valued. All right, so last, I would like to thank family and friends for their support over the years. So my mother, I couldn't have done this without her help. <laughs> Just get through this. Um, Mum gave up her job of 30 odd years to help me out when I was appointed as a lecturer and um, to a lecturer role in the department. She provided help, she brought up the kids, she cooked the tea, she did everything. So she, she was um, a, you know, effectively a second mother in her household and she was known affectionately by everyone as Nana Joy. Kate and Shannon and Ruben, Tui, Taharangi and Maya, we're a team. We've always been a team. And so I'm so appreciative of all that you've given to me over the years. My brother Brendan, thank you for all your support and likewise my extended family, Adam, Rachel, Ben and Sophie. My best friends, Catherine and Craig, you guys have always been there. You've always provided guidance and support and a good laugh when we've needed it. And then last, Alan. Just another note to say um, thank you very much. I couldn't have done it without you. It's, um, it, we often suffer from imposter syndrome as academics, and maybe especially female academics. Alan was always one for dampening that down, getting rid of that, um, yeah, and elevating, boosting our confidence. So thank you very much, Alan. Um, you've always been there. Uh, great mentor, as I said, yeah, great partner. So thank you for all your support. And thank you very much for joining me on this occasion. Tēnā koutou katoa and warm Pacific greetings, call Sarah Taiko Ingoa. Well, it's very hard to speak after that and sum up Fiona's work in five minutes before I invite you all for refreshments, but I'll do my best. Nā mihi nui Fiona, well done. Oh, you can relax now. Um, lovely to see your um, friends and whānau here and, um, and Professor Gia, or Alan, <laughs> as we knew him, lovely to see um, you again as well. Um, and it's also great to see friends and colleagues from the Department of Management and, um, and across the school as well as across the university. Thank you all for being here um, to celebrate this achievement um, today. So I'm delighted to be here today to thank Fiona for her insightful lecture, which not only reflects on her remarkable achievements thus far, but also at the end looks ahead for the future for more to come, which we know there will be. The field of HRM has been an interesting one, and I did actually back in the day teach um, HRM for, for a while. And we started off with that whole notion of this identity crisis around HRM. And so often practitioners and academics are not quite sure of the role that HRM plays in an organisation. Historically, the shift from personnel and industrial relations moved and indeed tried to elevate the management of human resources to senior le levels in the organisation. However, as Fiona has pointed out, in doing so, the field became focused on creating a much more singular set of objectives in the workplace, which meant that HRM was working to clearly align the goals of the human resources with the goals of the organisation, that very unitary position. So this is quite the opposite of um, Professor Edgar's work, which has been to recognise the plurality I'm saying that word quite a few times and I'm really worried how I'm going to say it, of voices in the workplaces. Taking a pluralistic perspective, her work has challenged the dominant unitaristic perspective on the employment relationship and acknowledges those conflicts and tensions across different workplace groups, for example, workers, employers, community and society, and seeks to manage those tensions for the benefit of all stakeholders. It takes into account broader social objectives of the, work, of the organisation and promotes employee engagement, well-being and participation in the workplace, which Professor Edgar has looked at through her career.
Indeed, Fiona's research aims to ensure that employees' views are heard and her early research was recognising those employees as important organisational stakeholders, which has continued, as you see, throughout her um, research career. Fiona's more recent work has focused on sustainable HRM as an outcome of adopting that pluralistic um, perspective. The increasing call for organisations and businesses to become more sustainable has meant that stakeholder voices has gained much more traction resulting in multiple voices and perspectives being recognised and acknowledged in the journey to become more sustainable. The role of pluralist HRM can be essential in the creation of frameworks to both encourage and manage those very different voices. Professor Edgar's research across wellbeing, commitment and employee voice has created valuable knowledge to help facilitate a more sustainable HRM and I look forward to where this work takes you next. Congratulations Fiona on having your work celebrated tonight. Congratulations too for being the first woman to be promoted to professor in the Department of Management. Your leadership is adding to the plurality of professors in the history of our department. And here's a gift um, for our appreciation. Um, to continue in these celebrations, it's my pleasure to invite you all to refreshments at the Staff Club, and we do hope um, that you can join us um, there. Um, Namahi nui matawa. Thank you very much.